All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Emily Di Giovanni, and I work with CTO on the Research Ready program. Welcome to this month's Research Ready Mentor Spotlight on Missing Data. So the Mentor Spotlight series is a monthly webinar series where an expert on a particular topic shares best practices and highlights exceptional processes relevant to the research community in Ontario and Canada. We aim to be interactive in the live sessions, but we also make this available online on demand at the link below. For more information on Research Ready, you can visit CTO's website. We also have a certificate of attendance for anyone that's here today live. We just ask you to complete a very short survey that will pop up at the end of the session, and this will allow us to create the certificate for those who are collecting continuing education credits. We're also looking for any feedback you have or topics you'd like to see, and we welcome that feedback regardless of the certificate. In terms of housekeeping, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so feel free to unmute yourselves at that time or use the chat. Um, and for today's presentation, we'll also pause midway through and take some questions. So today we'd like to welcome our speaker, Chris Battiston, who will be sharing his experience with us. Chris has over 20 years experience as a database administrator and analyst with more than half of that in healthcare. He has been a REDCap administrator for over 10 years and has won numerous awards for training documentation and community involvement. He has experience in data quality, regulations, validation, and training users. When he's not geeking out in front of a computer, he's spending time with his wife and toddler. So I'll pass it over to Chris now. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm excited to be presenting this topic. Um, so as Emily mentioned, the topic is missing data. Null doesn't mean useless. Um, and if you'd like to contact me, my email address is down there, chris.battiston at wchospital.ca. And I'll post that later on as well. Um, a quick note, my slides are rather text heavy. I do this on purpose because I don't like it when critical concepts are buried in the speaker's notes or not part of the slide at all. Um, screen readers can't pick up the flow between the speaker's notes and the slide, so they lose the flow that might be needed. People prefer that our people that prefer larger text can see everything with less scrolling and zooming. People can read it ahead if they choose or take their time to reread a section. And I find it makes it easier to see where I'm going if all the information is there at once. So you're not uh, trying to figure out where I'm gonna be leading the, the conversation or the presentation. I'll be going at a pace that feels comfortable to me, but uh, please flag if you have uh, any concerns about my speed and want me to go slower. I wanna make sure that everybody walks away with this presentation with some useful information. Um, so agenda, introductions, overview, or how I have learned to love null, or at least understand it. Just a high level uh, overview of the types of missing data. Uh, how to reduce the chances of what I'm calling unexplained missing data. And how to convince others that this is an important topic that needs to be considered. Um, just a note, I had initially prepared my slides, but then found an article by Zeria et al. In two, from 2013, which caused me to rewrite the presentation. I do highly recommend this article if you're interested in learning more, and it is part of the reference list at the end. Um, so as I'll only mention, I'm the database admin for the Research Institute at Women's College Hospital. I have about 10 years experience in REDCap and have been involved with literally hundreds of studies of all shapes and sizes. I have 20 years of experience as a database admin and a data analyst. And before working in healthcare, I worked at Bell Canada in telecom. And I can tell you missing data is an issue everywhere. It's not just a healthcare issue. Um, I have extensive experience in everything from software testing, SOPs, regulations, and a wide variety of data-related things. And although a lot of my opinions and thoughts on this have formed as a result of working in REDCap for many years, this is not a REDCap talk. I will refer to it once or twice, but wanted it to be generic. Um, an XKCD comic over here just saying, what are you working on? And the person at the laptop is saying, trying to fix the problems I created when I tried to fix the problems I created, when I tried to fix the problems I created, when dot, dot, dot. And I think if you've ever worked in a clinical trial, you are very familiar with that as a feeling. Um, 
overview of how I or, or how I learned to love null or at least understand it. Why is it so important to have a solid understanding of your missing data? I believe that there are a number of scenarios that may account for missing data that are not often discussed, but which I've seen countless examples of. Uh, branching or skip logic not properly set up, so questions are not appearing or hiding appropriately. The form slash survey is too long, so people will skip questions. The answer format is not appropriate to the question. For example, how often do you eat ice cream? And the options are yes and no. And the question is extremely personal in a study that may not be suitable. For example, extensive sexual history when the study has nothing to do with that area of a person's life. Uh, continued in my experience, a vast majority of causes for missing data can be picked up and fixed by extensive user acceptance testing or UAT. Although so seen by some as cumbersome and a quote pain to do, this is the only way to ensure that everything works as expected. And we shouldn't ask our participants to do something we ourselves find burdensome. So if you're finding it takes too long to do the survey, your participants are probably going to feel the same way and stop partway through. A couple of things to be aware of. Um, first and foremost, missing data is tricky for a lot of biostatisticians to deal with, at least in my experience, and many will have this as part of their CVs slash skill set if they're comfortable with it. Testing of dummy data, so dummy data would be the data that is collected during the user acceptance testing process, um, is key for the biostatistician to have a solid understanding of what the output will look like. This will allow them to start writing the analytical code, get a sense of possible data quality issues, and see what variables are critical to the analysis. This dummy testing, as I mentioned, would be generated as part of the UAT process. The biostatistician should have the final say about how the missing data will be handled. Although the PI and sponsor will have input, the biostatistician is the one formally trained to handle these situations. And I've seen a number of occasions where the biostatistician and the PI are literally butting heads over how the, the missing data should be handled. Um, so just be, you know, be aware that that may be something that you need to address. A couple of additional things to be aware of. Even if you take all the steps possible, you will still have missing data. So have a plan to act accordingly. The headache at the beginning will be a lot better than the frustration and scrambling at the end. Many of my suggestions need to be REV approved, so please check with them before implementing. I would hate for anybody to take my advice and turns out that uh, the, the process that they put in place needs to be uh, amended without the proper approvals. So there's three different types of missing data, and this comes directly from the Zuria et al. paper. Um, don't worry too much about this. I just wanted to give you a sense of what these look like. So the first is known as MCAR and stands for Missing Completely at Random. Examples include administrative censoring, follow-up is terminated because the study has ended, uh, migration study participants move and are unable to complete visits, or random failure of the experimental instrument. So for example, a test tube break, uh, an actigraphy failure, um, something broke that was unexpected during the, the study. The second type of missing data is, M, is known as MAR, or missing at random, and missing data caused by features of the study design, such as participants being removed from the trial if their conditions are not controlled sufficiently well according to the protocol criteria. So you've got time point one, time point two, and then they just dis disappear. Dropout based on recorded side effects or dropout based on known baseline characteristics. The third and final uh, formal type of missing data is missing not at random and dropout based on the unobserved response, e.g. a person not responding to treatment is more than likely not to provide an observation or participants miss a visit because they've had an outcome. These are all very heavily statistical, very heavy in statistics um, and require very specialized statistical uh, processes to handle. Um, but they are needed um, and you do need to understand them at least at a high level. What I'm proposing is what's called unexplained missing data. Um, and this goes beyond MCAR, MNAR, and MMAR, which I feel are explainable. 
Examples of unexplained missing data are cases when, for example, question 17 or question seven of a 15 question matrix is missed. Why this one question? Uh, a let us know your feelings notes field is blank. Most people given the opportunity will share their thoughts, even if it's just a sentence or two. And finally, questions with branching logic are behaving correctly, yet are still missed. So for example, do you like ice cream? And the branching logic is, what's your favorite flavor? But nobody answers that follow-up question. Why aren't they answering that follow-up question? So these are just things that you need to be aware of as you're building and as you're doing your testing. Um, as I mentioned, there are statistical methods for handling MCAR, MNAR, and MAR situations. I find these unexplained scenarios are far more difficult. They often require a case-by-case -case review for small number situations. So for example, if you've only got three or four people that consistently missed a question, um, or database reviews in cases where a significant number of records have the same missing question. So why did 55% of your population miss question seven? Um, and that may require follow-up phone calls that may require additional steps, but um, that'll be study specific. I'm going to pause here for a couple of minutes just to see if there's any questions and post my email address again. Um, I can't guarantee answers, but I do have a lot of resources that I can share if you are looking for more information. Um, so if you want to post in the chat any questions that you have or um, email me, I can definitely see what I can do. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, so if anyone wants to um, use the chat function right now, or you can feel free to um, raise your hand and unmute yourselves um, if you have any questions. Um, and then we will be um, doing a QA and a at the end as well. Nobody has any questions? Okay, either everybody's asleep or I'm doing a good job explaining. So let's, uh, I'll give it another 30 seconds and then we'll pick up. Should you use Little's test to determine MCAR? Um, that would be something that you'd have to talk to your biostatistician about. Um, I'm not a statistician, I'm a database admin. I know enough to know, I don't know a lot. Um, but I have used Little's test before, and it does depend on the type of data from what I understand, but that would definitely be a conversation you have to have with the biostatistician because from what I understand, the database may need to be set up in a particular way or particular variables or that sort of thing. So um, I can't give you a definitive answer, but that's the best I can give you. All right. Uh, Will the slides and recording be made available? Yeah, um, I've made sure that uh, Emily has the slides and the recording will be posted as well. Um, okay, so picking up where we left off, how to reduce the chances of unexplained missing data. There are a variety of ways to minimize missing data. Obviously not all will be appropriate in every case, so mix and match as needed. Um, the first key one is understanding your study population. I've got a project that I'm working on right now where target participants are going to be from uh, lower income areas of Toronto. I'm therefore building the project with the following uh, features or if you want unfeatures. Uh, save and return. Participants will get a code that they can use to pick up where they left off. There will be a minimal amount of custom programming. So if they have to pay for their monthly usage, i.e. they get 50 gigs a month, they're less likely to watch videos or um, do more intensive things on their phone or on their device. So I'm going to build the survey with a minimal amount of contact and content and quote, no extra features. Paper copies or downloadable PDF. At the start of the survey, offer a way for participants to download the forms and then fill them in. This will require manual entry on the part of the study team and the forms won't look as nice, have the branching logic, etc. But you're likely to get more complete and uh, more fulfill, more fulsome survey responses. Mobile friendly. Not everybody has a computer or a tablet, but most people have a phone with a browser. Build the survey with mobile screens in mind and test on as many models as possible. So there's a couple of different um, 
uh, software applications that you can use for testing on different mimicked devices. Uh, that may be something that you want to take a look at or just use people from your study team to test the survey. Um, other things that you can do to try and reduce the amount of missing, unexplained missing data include offering prefer not to answer not applicable, I don't know as options, uh, progress bars or page X of Y so people can gauge how much they have left, missing data codes when doing data entry to indicate the question was in fact missed rather than uh, inadvertently skipped. Um, and this is something that I do use within REDCap for a lot of the projects that I build is there's missing data codes that can be applied project specifically. Um, so for example, unknown, not available, trace amounts. So depending on the question and depending on the project, that may be something that's worthwhile looking into. Um, another thing that I've recently started doing is offering survey feedback for the first small percentage of participants just to ask them how was your how was the survey type question um, we've gotten some really good feedback we've made revisions and through the REB amendments and everything to some surveys uh, based on this feedback and it's just a nice way to let the participants know that your thoughts and uh, ideas are appreciated and uh, being taken into consideration uh, the other thing that we do uh, often is some patient pilot testing. So we have a very large group of patient experience advisors at Women's College um, or research volunteers that may be patients within the clinic. Um, they would be a great way to get this done. Alternatively, you can do a targeted follow-up after the first 10 patients, um, either by phone call or email. You just completed this, just wanted to follow up. Um, just to get their ideas and how they felt the survey went. Um, additionally, there's phone-based follow-up for any missing questions. Um, I do have a couple of projects where the research staff will follow up on 100% of the missing questions. Messages at the bottom of each survey page, for example, you can use something like, it appears you may have missed one or more questions above, and using skip logic if any of the quest critical questions are blank. Um, and if all the critical questions are filled in, then that message would not show up. Uh, field notes to provide definitions, explanations, et cetera. So for example, if you've got a race question and you want somebody to understand what the definition of race is, you would just provide a smaller uh, sized font underneath or to the left to say race would be defined as, et cetera. And then having accessibility issues taken into account. So text to speech, text can be enlarged on a mobile browser, that sort of thing. Um, and this is something that I've recently started working on to try and understand how to allow the surveys and allow the forms to be more accessible to a larger patient population. Um, because obviously if we're in healthcare and we're looking at patients, you're gonna have patients that have uh, vision issues potentially or other cognitive issues that may pose uh, them difficulties when filling in the surveys. So what not to do? Make every question mandatory in a long survey or when it's a sensitive population. Um, you may have a, I've recently built a survey for a transgender population study and none of the questions are mandatory. We, you can come in, you can fill in two questions and then leave if you want. Um, sort of counterpoint to this, um, offering monetary compensation, basing it on the completion of all answers. If the survey is going to professionals or, for example, healthcare providers, I'm a little less concerned about it, but um, I realize this may be controversial, but people shouldn't feel pressured to answer every question for a gift card or honoraria. Um, and as I said, I do realize that's sort of counterpoint to my topic, but I have seen people going in and just doing not applicable, not applicable, not applicable, which obviously doesn't tell us anything. Um, phone or email participants, when it's not clearly indicated, this may be part of the follow-up and that they've agreed to this contact. So rather than calling people just out of the blue to say, oh, hi, you did this survey, making it part of the ICF, making it part of that initial conversation. Um, asking questions that are seemingly unrelated to the study, so extensive sexual history on an orthopedic study, for example, or sexual orientation in a nutrition study, which I've seen examples of, not 
those two areas specifically, but um, again, knowing what the population that you're going to be studying is, knowing how that data will be used, whether or not it's going to be a strato stratified variable or not, um, and just making sure that it's all appropriate. Um, how to convince others that this topic is important. This can be one of the toughest challenges when putting together a trial. I've yet to find the quote foolproof argument, the one that I can use every time and convince everyone. But here's some suggestions that you can use. First off, it's easier to deal with it at the beginning than at the end. Coming up with detailed plans, including a data management plan, DMP, and a statistical analysis plan, SAP, not only ensures that everyone's on the same page, but they'll also keep the team from struggling at the end trying to figure out how to handle the missing data. This may even result in saving the team money. If, for example, you're paying a contract biostatistician per hour, um, use their time wisely because it could end up being a very expensive uh, line in the budget. Improve the relationship with the community, especially if you're looking at a specific population, e.g. people who have recently given birth. Making the surveys as user-friendly and as accessible as possible will enable them to fill everything in. This also helps to, to ensure the willingness to participate in future studies. And depending on the population, they may use word of mouth or um, social media channels to share your study or to not share your study, depending on how uh, they felt it went. Um, so again, making sure that everything looks good and everything aligns with the, the population is key. Um, so as I said, you feel free to email me if you want. Um, there's my email address. I'm also on LinkedIn, but not very active. I'm always happy to chat data. I'm always happy to, you know, uh, chat REDCap or data collection methods. And then some references and recommended reading. Um, this book by O'Kelly and Radich is really, really technical. It's a SAS book specifically, but um, I highly recommend chapter two, The Prevention of Missing Data. The National Academies Press has a fantastic book on the prevention and treatment of missing data in clinical trials. It's from 2010, so it's a little dated, excuse me, it's a little dated in areas, but I think it's still a worthwhile um, um, point to start. Strategies for dealing with missing data in clinical trials from design uh, to analysis, that's the Thierry et al. article. And then two additional ones uh, that I thought might be worthwhile. Again, a little technical. This one's a 30-page one that's got some statistics and stuff thrown in, but the concepts, I think, are still very, very worthwhile. And the uh, Rowanwall and Deckers is a nice short one just talking about the impact of what's not there. Um, I've also got a variety of other PDFs on this topic, and if you're interested, uh, as I mentioned, feel free to email me. Um, I did see a question in the chat. What do you mean by extra features when setting up the questionnaire? So things like um, embedded videos or things that might cause the bandwidth to be a little more on the high side for the person to use the survey. Um, one of the things that I do is in REDCap, there's the ability to, um, within your browser, there's the ability to see what's called packet size. And again, this is getting too technical for this topic, but um, there are ways to look at how much downloadable content there is and how much um, bandwidth the person's gonna need to download that content or open that survey. So there's, there's ways that you can look at that and keeping things at a minimal uh, level would help keep the, um, impact to the person's device as low as possible, if that makes sense. Thanks, Chris. Um, that was a very informative presentation. Um, so thank you for going over all of that. Um, at this time, we're going to take questions. Um, so feel free to use the chat or you can unmute yourselves and ask a question. Um, anything related to data. Um, if you have any questions more um, geared toward REDCap, um, you can email Chris as well um, or ask yep. them now. Um,
Hello, Chris. Uh, this is Tanvir. So I I met you actually when while you were working at Sick Kids, and you were <laughs> nice. definitely a, a great <laughs> you are definitely a great resource for us. Okay. So now I have a question regarding the export in Redcap. Like when I export the data from a Redcap project. Um, you know, some of the questions have a parent-child relationship, like the branching logic, right? So when you yeah. have uh, a branching logic, like only if the parent is applicable, then the child data shows up. So, so this is different when you when you export the data when um, a child field is a checkbox type field. Yes, um, I'm pretty sure you, you know this, right? Because the checkbox. The, the default answer, default value is zero. Yeah. And yep. so basically what I'm trying to see here, say here, like when I send the data export to statisticians, they are actually having a difficult time in understanding red, red cap export and yep. how red cap is managing the missing data. Yeah. Because if it's a radio button, the data, the, the, the no value would show up for the child variables. But yeah. if it's a checkbox, it will still have a default value. So the, the zero, 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 the statisticians, zero. Yeah, all, all yeah. zeros, right? So the statisticians thinks that this is um, a value of zero, like a no, for example. Yeah. yeah. Right, so do you have any suggestion how to manage this? So this is something that I've been struggling with because you're right, this is something that is a known issue within REDCap. The way that I handle it mm -hmm. is um, using the variable names, I'll come up with prefixes. So for example, um, if it's the medical history, uh, previous surgery question, have you ever had other surgeries? Um, I will name the variable M MHX underscore prev underscore surge underscore yn. That tells me that it's a yes, no question and that it's um, previous medical history, medical surgeries on the medical history form. The follow-up questions will then have that same prefix of mhx underscore base or prev surge q1 or, you know, um, surge type. And then uh, surge year and surgeries and that sort of thing. So when you're looking okay. at the data dictionary, you'll see that they're all the same seven or eight characters at the very beginning. Um, and that way then that tells me that if I'm seeing a lot of zeros, that probably that trigger question was not responded to. Um, I also make sure that the biostatistician gets a copy of the code book or the data dictionary before we move to production um, so that they understand how I've set the database up. We can work through issues like the checkbox issue or um, calculated fields that are randomly showing up, you know, throughout the, throughout the data. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it's one of those things where I don't work in isolation. I work very closely with the study team. I work very closely with the data analyst or the statistician on the study team. And the more I share, the more I communicate, then you know everybody's happy at the end. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of extra work because it's additional meetings, it's back and forth, it's emails, it's everything else. But at the end of the day, I think everybody's a lot happier for that. Okay, excellent. So I, I actually like the idea, like how you are setting the variable short names with prefixes, right? So then yeah. at a glance, the statistician will be will be able to understand the, the child variable is not actually missing, yeah. but it is not applicable because the parent field uh, is showing otherwise. Exactly. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. So actually uh, the follow-up question is like, did you actually find this method in in somewhere or like it's just you basically did it yourself it, it's me based on a lot of conversations with people that analyze red cap data um, when i worked at okay. sick kids um, i worked very closely with three statisticians specifically 
Um, and they each had their own preferences for how the data would look. You know, if it was a longitudinal, this person wanted it wide, this person wanted it long, this person wanted something okay. else. Um, but the one thing that they all said was critical was they wanted to be able to glance at a variable and know what it was. So rather than okay. having something like, I don't know, Q1, Q2, Q3, which tells you nothing, having those short variable names be descriptive in some way makes life a lot easier. Um, yeah. So I use things like DX for disease, TX for treatment, uh, BX for biopsy. Um, so you'd have BX underscore site one, BX underscore year one, BX underscore and so on and so forth for various biopsies. Um, and again, providing the code book or the data dictionary is always a good idea. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I got it then. So basically what, how you are naming the variables, like the naming convention, it, it, you basically invented it like with your experience and wisdom, right? So there is yeah. no reference or document that we can follow. Like, so this is how you should uh, no. name the variables so that the missing data are managed well. Okay. No, no unfortunately not. I've, I've considered posting something to the um, REDCap training repository, just outlining how I, you know, set up my variables. Mm -hmm. I just haven't had a chance to sit down and actually formalize my thoughts. So, um, but again, feel free to email me if you do want to ever yeah. uh, chat further. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Um, I do see Susan has a question about branching logic showing up if the respondent prints out a hard copy of the survey from REDCap. Unfortunately, no. Um, one thing that I will do, though, is if I know it's going to be, like in this uh, lower income survey that I'm working on, I use descriptive fields. So I will have a section or a section header saying, um, you know, the, the first question in this section is your trigger question or your primary question. The following questions are only going to be needed if you've answered yes. Um, it's not a great way because if you're sitting there and you're doing it on your phone or on your tablet or on your laptop, you'll still see that in some cases. Um, there's some action tags now that you can use to hide specific fields on a survey and only show them on a PDF, for example, or vice versa. Um, so I'm going to be using those in this case because this is the first time I'm using these action tags in a project like this. So um, yeah, what I'll do is I'm going to hide it on these descriptive fields on the survey, but show them on the PDF. Um, and hopefully that'll at least help. Hopefully that answers your question, Susan. No problem. Any other questions? Um, so Chris, we got a question, um, which I think you touched on on one of your slides. Um, how would you involve patients when developing surveys? So we have, let me go back to that slide here. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Um, so we've got a program at Women's College for patient experience advisors. So patients from the cardiology clinic get involved and help out in various aspects of the cardiology clinic. Um, if you've got a program like that, that would be a great way because you're going to get people that have indicated that they're interested in supporting the hospital, they're already patients, they already know the environment. Um, alternatively, research volunteers. So if you're going to be running a long-term study, for example, and you've got the ability to get a couple of volunteers, you may post something in the clinic or something. Um, alternatively, you can have something in your ICF to say, we're going to randomly follow up with the first 10 patients or 10 patients out of the first 50 or whatever. Um, if you're interested in helping us, you know, support this project, please say yes, no, that sort of thing. Um, so again, it really depends on your environment, on the study. Um, but I do think it's important. And I do think that if this is going to be a key study, that it's a good way to get that feedback.
All right. If um if anyone has any additional questions, um again, feel free to pop them in the chat um, or you can unmute and ask Chris. I've got a full cup of tea here, so I got loads of time. <laughs> um uh, hi Chris. I actually have one question. Yeah. Um so I'm not I, I guess it's a question of whether you've had ex any experience doing this, so whether it's good practice or not. Um, we've created a couple of red cap forms that some filled out by our internal clinic team coordinators, some filled out by patients. And um, I've noticed like sometimes in watching people fill out the forms, if it at first glance seems like there's an overwhelming number of fields, they may sometimes just skip past certain fields. I guess it's like visual overload. Um, yes. I guess one uh, solution to do that is, you know, you hide all the fields. You just show the first couple of fields and then other fields pop up as you continue filling it out. So branching logic, not based on a um, yes or no selection, but just based on uh, as fields get a value in it. And that kind of like helps guide the visual of completing it. Um, but I guess that also does kind of hide the you have this amount of data to fill out. So you are yep. this percent of the way through the form. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I would actually recommend not doing the branching logic based on the previous question, because if you need to add in a question, so for example, if you're six months down the road and you realize, oh, we've got to ask this follow-up wow. question or something, it's going to throw everything off. Um, so what I typically do is if it's a survey, um, REDCap, and I can't remember what version this was in. I think it's been around for a while. But surveys, you can set a um, turn on a setting so that the section headers allow for a page break. Um, so what I've done is I actually have one transgender study where it's extremely intense. There's a lot of questions. Um, we're estimating it's going to take people about 90 minutes to fill in. Um, so every question is it's on its own page. Um, it took a long time because it was built adding in section headers between each question, but that allows for the person to sit here and focus on that particular question, answer it, click next. Answer the next question, click next. Um, the other thing that we've done is interspersed uh, pauses for the person. Um, so for this particular survey, bandwidth and data usage wasn't a concern. So we've actually got little videos uh, for the person to watch to take their mind off the previous section. Um, if it's a data collection form, as in the person is logging in and filling in the questions directly into REDCap, um, I again would split it up into specific forms. So section one, baseline, section two, eligibility, section three. So you can go in and fill those questions in, save and go to the next form, save and go to the next form, which is one of the drop downs uh, down at the bottom right when you're filling in the status. Yep. Um, and that would allow for the person to pause and come back, download a specific form, for example, as a PDF. Um, and just makes it a little a little cleaner and a little easier to use. Um, the other thing that I just meant to mention as well, um, talking about mobile devices, I typically don't use drop downs um, in my surveys because I find that if you're on a mobile device, specifically a phone, and you're trying to scroll, if the list is really really long, sometimes you may click on or press on the wrong option or think you've selected something and you haven't. And so the, the drop downs, they're useful, but I don't find them to be very efficient uh, ways of data collection. I much prefer radio buttons um, to follow up that with, well then, what if it's a long list of radio buttons? There's actually a multi-column radio button plugin that you can use um, where you can specify the number of columns and then it sorts things into uh, that number of columns for that radio button question. Um, so again, it's it's the knowing, and it's impossible to know all the features of REDCap because there's just so many, but it's literally taking the time I find to sit there, build a dummy, dummy project, 
turn things on, turn things off, see what this does, see what that does, see what this looks like, you know. Um, I probably have 35 or 40 different uh, test projects in different platforms just because of all the testing and the features and the proof of concepts that I've done. So um, it takes time, but I think it's worth it in the long run. All right, thanks very much. All good ideas. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any additional questions for Chris? Um, again, feel free to pop them in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself as well. Okay, I think if we have no more questions coming in, um, I want to say a big thank you to Chris um, for that wonderful presentation um, and a thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we will post this recording up on CTO's website um, in about a week. Um, and then if anyone um, wants a copy of the slides, um, feel free to reach out to CTO or to Chris. Um, and again, Chris has grace, graciously shared his email address and contact info with us. Um, so feel free to reach out to him if you have any additional questions. Um, as a reminder, um, our post-session survey will pop up on your screen um, once this meeting ends. And it's a few short questions to receive your certificate of attendance. Um, and stay tuned for CTO's newsletter with information on our next mentor spotlight. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.